Yesterday, gentlemen, we were talking about the victory parade in Moscow. And today we are seeing another meeting between United States and Russia. Uh, Mr. Walsh, how much can we expect really from this round of meeting as the last round was pretty much a disappointment? Yeah, Tian, I think you're right to have referenced that earlier meeting in Moscow roughly a month ago where Tillerson not only met with Lavrov but spent two hours with Putin and by all accounts it was sort of frosty. The good news was they came out of that meeting saying we're going to have a working group, we're going to work on some of these issues. This is a follow-on to that. Uh, I think maybe things are a little less tense. This was the previous meeting was in the direct aftermath of the uh, chemical weapons controversy. So things have calmed down a bit. But in the U.S., Russia continues to be a major political story. And uh, I would say that the Trump administration's views on Syria have gone back and forth and are rather hard to pin down. So I would have modest, mm. modest expectations about this meeting, particularly as it relates to Ukraine. But I'm guessing that, you know, you mentioned bilateral issues. Both countries have things to complain about. The U.S. may very well raise what it perceives as Russian violations of the INF Treaty, the right. uh, nuclear treaty. And Russia will probably raise uh, questions about expanding missile defenses, which it is unhappy with. Modest, is that the key word, Minister Sloboda, that you would like to use about the result? Yeah, I, I think we should have realistic and limited expectations. Uh, first and foremost, the two primary issues of discussion, uh, Syria uh, and Ukraine, are ones where uh, the Obama administration and the Putin administration had wildly divergent, I, I think you could say quite accurately, directly opposing sides. Uh, it is unclear how much that has shifted with the new Trump administration. The new Trump administration does not have uh, all of its people online at the Russia desk in the State Department and elsewhere. Um, I think they're a little behind the curve on this. Uh, it's not unusual. President Putin has previously remarked that President Obama took eight months to fully get together his team to be able to seriously sit mm. down with Russia on these complicated issues. Uh, but also as well, there seems to be a great deal of infighting uh, in the Trump administration between Trump and Congress, these neo-McCarthyite witch hunts. Uh, of a partisan flavor in the United States right. uh, that is seeking to draw Russia into their uh, election fiasco. Um, and um, uh, I, I think Trump and the U.S. deep state perhaps themselves have wildly diverging views on both the Syria uh, and Ukraine crisis, where he, at least during his campaign and somewhat after, indicated he's in favor of detente right. and cooperation so, with Russia. So, Mr. Felgenauer, isn't that the best time for Russia to uh, streamline its uh, new strategy toward the United States while Washington seemed to have uh, infights going on in an intense way? Uh, well, we rather already know what's going to be at uh, this meeting. Uh, on Tuesday, there was a preliminary meeting, and after it, uh, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rabkov, who talked in New York to his uh, uh, counterpart in the State Department, uh, said to journalists that the meeting is going to be primarily about Syria. I don't think that Ukraine will be much there on the agenda at all. And on Syria, Russia has right now a very concrete thing it wants from the United States. Last week in Astana, uh, there was a memorandum signed on the de so-called de-escalation in Syria. And after that, uh, Russia has tabled a, a resolution in the United Nations Security Council to get a UN mandate for that backing up that memorandum. So right mm. now, Moscow very much wants for the Trump administration not to oppose that and maybe support, or at least not to oppose, for this mandate to go through. And I believe that's what really ra Russia wants, and that's what it wants right now, and this mm. is very concrete. Mr. Wash, uh, can Washington, at least uh, even with the lack of personnel dealing with Russia, even with a lot of disagreements going on, be able to, at least from the Trump administration, support that? Well, you know, it's interesting that uh, one spot that is filled is the uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, mm. Ambassador Haley. And she has often staked out what might be called a more independent view on foreign policy, separate from uh, what Secretary Tillerson has said. So I, I think that remains to be determined. Uh, she's 
tended to take a tougher line on Russia, a tougher line on uh, Syria, a tougher line on other uh, uh, issues with other countries. So uh, it, absent a meeting of the minds there, I, I, I would have to wait and see. I, I don't think she's going to be enthusiastic about it. This is exactly the confusion, isn't it, gentlemen? I mean, at this point, I don't even yes, know which exactly. code I should use right now that, that would indicate certain yeah. directions from the United States about what to do with Russia, even though the other yes. side it seems to be quite clear. So, <laughs> Mr. Sloboda, uh, which line of rhetorics should we read? Or actually, we should read all of them and try to figure out yeah. what is likely to be the strategy behind this or lack of strategies behind this. Yeah, I, I prefer not to, to, to view rhetoric and prefer to look at, at, at facts on the ground. I, I don't think we should take the pronouncements out of Nikki Haley seriously. Um, she's uh, an appointment with absolutely zero foreign policy education or experience. I don't really know why she's at the United Nations except to bolster her domestic political career. Um, the Secretary of State has already tried uh, once to put her in her place and remind her that anything she says should be constructed right. from building blocks um, of policy built by the State Department. Um, but I think there are some hopeful signs, despite the, the U.S.'s illegal unilateral attack on, on the Syrian government where, and a base where Russian military were stationed. Uh, since then, uh, we have seen uh, U.S. military forces and Russian military forces, both in support of respectively uh, Eastern and Western Kurdish forces, move to the Turkish border, uh, seemingly in coordination, uh, to limit any further uh, Turkish regime invasion and incursions uh, into Syria. Um, and that, that seems to have some effect, and, and, and certainly uh, the, uh, the, the office of of uh, Erdogan, uh, okay. his ministers have been replying and actually making threats against U.S. soldiers that participated in this. That's some positive signs on the ground in Syria, and I, th I think uh, we, we shouldn't be too pessimistic moving forward. Well, Mr. Felgenhauer, though, I would like to ask you two questions as a result of the answer from Mr. Uh, Sleboda. First of all, is do you agree with him about the latest analysis of what's going on in Syria, Russia's role, and U.S. likely position? Secondly, of course, is about the fact that it seems the investigation about, against the President Trump by certain teams are still going on. Drip, drip, drip. The latest question is about why Flynn was only fired 18 days after the facts became clear. So I'm sure further things will come up as well. With all of these mixed, will Washington be able to approach Russia's position on Syria in a friendly way, at least by the Trump administration? Uh, well, the uh, Trump administration seems to be, to a large extent, not very functional, to put it mildly. And uh, the continuing Russian uh, Trump connection investigations in Congress and by the uh, United States, uh, American intelligence community and FBI are going to, of course, weigh heavily on any capability of the Trump administration to move into any kind of closer, more cooperative, cooperative uh, relationship with Russia in Syria or anywhere else in the world. Mm. Uh, there in Syria, right now, Russia and the United States are not really opposing each other at all, which mm. is good. Uh, but on the same, on the other side of it, it's, um, I don't see how they could really cooperate. Because, I, because not only because of the Russian investigation back in the United States, but also because the Russian military and the American military don't really want to become too intimate with each other, mm -hmm. because that could uh, disclose uh, secrets on, scar on recon uh, gathering that both sides uh, would want to keep a very, very secret. These are the uh, crown jewels. So I don't think that both military are going to be very enthusiastic, even I if see. they're asked by their political masters to cooperate. 
And that means, well, most likely we're going to be in the same kind of state, not opposing each other, uh, at the same time not very cooperating mm. with each other. I believe that's understood in Moscow. May, may so right now we, we want only one thing from the Americans. Don't veto the resolution on uh, the Astana agreement. Well, is it asking too much, Mr. Walsh? Well, I, I, I agree that we're not going to see any real military cooperation, but I do think there could be political cooperation, whether it's this UN resolution, whether it's agreement about safe zones or other issues related to humanitarian that aid means, and de escalation. That, 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 really, that really means, uh, Mr. Walsh, when you're saying that, that means already great progress, I have to say. Well, if, if, if that happens, and I will disagree with my colleague uh, uh, about the effects of the investigation about Russia. Uh, and also the other colleague who said it was a witch hunt. That awfully, that sounds like conspiracy theories to me. Uh, this is a bipartisan investigation. The heads of the intelligence it community does, have repeatedly uh, <laughs> testified to the fact that there were issues here. And I think that'll go on. But I think actually the U.S. system has enough uh, play here that it can treat that as one issue and not necessarily have that spill over into Russia policy. Mm. I, I do think that the you know, going forward, the, uh, Trump's original inclination, it seemed to me, was to uh, uh, have a policy that was more in coordination uh, with Russia, uh, less focused on Assad, more focused on ISIS. And then we, it all got sort of derailed over the uh, chemical weapons uh, attack, which I believe the international community has concluded was carried out by Assad forces. But in any case, uh, the, the question is, can they get back to where they were prior to that? I wouldn't rule that out. The problem here, Deanna, and okay. you've referred to it already, is, you know, is the U.S. policy on Tuesday going to be the same as it is on Thursday? And there's just so much shifting here. It's hard to know whether it's by words or by action. Well, it's hard to know what the consistent policy will be. You know, there's at least a Friday. Maybe some policy <laughs> could come out on that. I don't know. So let's go to Mr. Sloboda. You seem to, first of all, disagree with some of the facts that stated by Mr. Walsh, and he also seems to disagree with the final conclusion as well. Mr. Sloboda. Yeah, there, there seems to be a tendency of people out of the West, and, and being a U.S. military veteran myself, I, can, I can think I can attest to this, people in the West, to speak of themselves in the West as the international community or as the world when really they're only a very small part of it, if a rather loud and, and boisterous one. Um, I think that's a little bit of solipsism here. Um, certainly, the, the, the consensus of the yeah, international I'm referring to uh, Amnesty International, the U, weapons, UN Rights uh, Watch. Incident. Okay. I see different opinions over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Gongos f funded and organized out of the West, yes. Um, yeah, we, now, we know is that, that a conspiracy Al Qaeda, uh, Khan Shaikun is an Al Qaeda stronghold. I think anything without any investigation on the ground there really can't be any proof of what Al Qaeda's narrative is okay. out of Khan Shaikun. All right. Now, gentlemen, I want you to sit back a little bit. We earlier talked about a very specific picture about this meeting, about these scenarios in Syria. Now we sit back. At the earlier stage of Trump administration, its campaign, it was talking about closer relationship with Russia because it seems candidate Trump wants to change the overall momentum about how U.S. foreign policy is doing. Now things getting really bogged down, not to mention there are so many investigations and also in fights at the parliament, at the Congress rather. So how will this what would this mean, Mr. Falkenhauer, for any possibility of a new direction of U.S. foreign policy? Is President Trump, as a result, going to once again become what the other presidents were like toward Russia? Well, Russia's, uh, what Russia wants from the, uh, from the United States, Trump or no Trump, is uh, a recognition that Russian increased and increasing influence in a post-Soviet space is a good thing hmm. and should not be opposed or seen as a threat to the West. Can uh, Trump produce that? That's very questionable. He said he wants the deal. 
but a deal would mean that Russia should surrender something, and there are things that Moscow is not ready to surrender at all. And that is primarily, of course, uh, uh, the post-Soviet space, and uh, it's uh, growing as it believes influence there. And of course, and also there are the American bases and forces in Europe that Russia sees, Russian military see as very threatening. The uh, missile defense bases in Poland and Romania that Russia believes should be removed, and forces should be run back from the uh, front line of NATO. Mm. So there's uh, Russia has a very big list of what it would want to get, and it's not clear what it can give Trump in return for him to produce that to the American public that he made a good deal. Okay. Very briefly from the other two guests, uh, 30 seconds for each if I can. Has that quote-unquote window opportunity been missed already between Washington and Moscow now? Mr. Sloboda. Yeah, I, I think that whatever Trump's initial inclinations were, that the U.S. deep state has used these witch hunts in, 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 in an attempt uh, by the blob and, and, and the deep state to uh, end that. And they have been fairly successful so far. Um, uh, any attempt by Trump to improve relations uh, will be greeted extremely hostily by the press uh, and by the, the, the deep state, the, the, the duopoly parties in Congress. Uh, but I think that he will attempt to make room to maneuver in that direction wherever and whenever he can. All right. Midterm election already upcoming next year. This is big political cycle for United States. Uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, how do you think that relationship is likely to be shaped by all of these things? Well, if uh, Mr. Trump's party suffers big losses at the midterms, it will weaken his already weak position and make it more difficult. But the presidents always have more leeway in foreign policy. So I think it's possible uh, that there could be an improvement in the U.S.-Russian relationship despite uh, Republican orthodoxy on it. I think it's possible. The deal here so far, right. and we don't have a lot of data, Mr. Trump does not look like a strategist. He seems like a guy who reacts to events, and events in the future are very hard to predict.